Well, you know, I I grew up in a little town in New Mexico, and and uh, my dad played for dances and stuff like that. So I was calling square dances when I was when I was ten years old, mm. and and then I I was in my first play when I was in the the eighth grade, and 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 being being a bit of a show off. <laughs> <laughs> I I I love that uh, that the the fact that I could get laughs and 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 not get in trouble for it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> which I which I had always before. I, I, I mean so and then this whole idea of performing that I was always in musical groups and and things like that. I when I was in high school and college I had a rock and roll band. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was with a singing group when I was in high school and we got we got noticed, but it, it, most people don't realize this. But in in uh, Portales, New Mexico, where I grew up, 19 miles north of that was Clovis, New Mexico, and in the late 50s and early 60s, Clovis, New Mexico, was a hotbed of recording. Um, hmm. Norman Petty Studios were there. That's where that's where Buddy Holly cut Peggy Sue. Mm-hmm. Uh, wow. There was a there was a famous. Uh, country artist named Charlie Phillips that cut uh, Sugar Time there, uh, the Fireballs and Sugar Shack, those oh. were all cut there. And, and So Norman Petty saw a, a singing group I was with when I was in high school and hired us uh, to sing backup. On, uh, so I was making records when I was in, in high school. Now, mm. I put myself through high school and college uh, with a rock and roll band, and and I majored in theater in college, and then during the summers, you know, I went to, uh, and so when I when I graduated from college, my wife Mary had a National Science Foundation fellowship mm-hmm. to Sloan uh, to uh, Georgetown University in uh, Washington D.C. And so she got her Ph.D. in chemistry there, and I went to work for Arena Stage there, and so I, that's where I started my that was my first big professional jobs, but. At the same time, I was playing at a at a club there called the Cellar Door, which is legendary, yeah, and 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 Mr. Henry. So I was playing folk music in those places, mm-hmm. and so early in my career, uh, I got my first film, Deliverance, uh, because I could play, because I could play music, uh, and my second big film was Bound for Glory with Hal Ashby, and 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 uh, I got that largely because I, I was a musician. Wow. So, so these uh, these two uh, passions of yours, uh, acting and, and, and music, yeah. um, they do intermingle for you. Do they do something different to you? Do they complete you in a different way somehow? They do, and I can. I mean, I, I love acting, and don't get me wrong. I, I I'm a I'm an ardent <laughs> lover of, of the acting. But I'll mm-hmm. tell you what, I love the music even more, mm-hmm. and I, and I kept I kept trying to figure out what it was because I certainly can't make nearly the money <laughs> in, in music <laughs> right. that I can in acting but there's there's a thing about as much as I love acting no matter how you slice it no matter, no matter what kind of acting it is whether it's movies television plays you name it there is and must be that imaginary fourth wall between you and the audience mm. With music, especially the kind of music I do, because I, I, I do music where I also tell stories and, and connect as much as I can with the audience, there is the possibility of a profound one-on-one sharing that takes mm-hmm. place. And, and that sharing, I find to be an opiate that nothing else can touch. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's, it's, um, it's very pure. Uh, and, it is, it, and I think with acting in film, there are all these different elements that come in: the way your performance is cut, the choices the director makes, the, anything that can that can somehow um, uh, change uh, what you think you're you're doing. Exactly. Whereas when you're, yeah, yeah, the music is your own. The music yeah, you, have, that, that, you have, you feel completely in control more than you would with the role. Of course, and not only that. I mean, I mean, I'm the one that's making all the decisions. Yeah, <laughs> you that's know, big, the, the, by telling, boss. yeah, by telling this story, the way I like to do shows anyway is I like to set up songs. 
with a story which may or may not be true, mm-hmm. but, but one which 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 leads the audience in a way that I want them to go, and and then they get the payoff, or and I get the payoff in the song, and mm-hmm. and it, it, so therefore I I feel like I get to use all the arrows in my quiver, if you will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But even so, uh, you hear from a lot of actors, uh, and they tend to be, surprisingly so, very introverted people, particularly as adolescents and growing into adulthood. But you don't strike me as, as particularly introverted, uh, the way I, you're describing yourself. Not at all. I, 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 shy, I would, I would say that, I, you know, in, in just sort of ordinary social situations, I tend to be more shy. Mm-hmm. But, but I, I know that, that somehow doesn't make sense when actors say that they're shy. But, mm-hmm. but, but I've seen a number of actors that, is, that we're, we're okay once we're in that comfort zone that that we know about but for sure. just in ordinary social situations I, I i think of myself as being a shy person uh, not an introvert but a shy person tell me about the deliverance experience obviously this is your first major movie your first time on camera if i understand correctly correct uh, and, and most people don't realize you know this was ned Beatty's first film too yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And, wow. Yeah, and people, Ned and I got cast completely uh, separate from each other. They didn't know we know knew each other, and Ned and I had been best friends for six years before that, <laughs> and, and had done twenty five or thirty plays together. And he's still one of my closest friends in the world. <laughs> mm. So it was really serendipitous that 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 we got to play. You know, the original concept of Deliverance was that John Borman really wanted to do that film with he he really wanted to do it with all unknowns. Mm-hmm. Uh, mainly because he didn't want anyone to be safe. That sounds it, like him. It, yeah, by that I meant, you know, in, in especially in those days if you had Robert Redford or somebody like that in the movie, you knew he was safe. He was never going to get killed. Right. Sure. And and so John wanted everyone to be at risk in mm-hmm. the movie. And so actually in terms of, of finding the characters they came to New York. I was living in New York at the time, and they came to New York looking for good unknown actors. And God knows I was unknown. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was actually the first actor they saw in New York, not because I was at the top of anyone's list, but because uh, because I was so unknown that they asked me to come in 30 minutes before they were going to start seeing people mm-hmm. to see if I was worth seeing. So I went in and met with Lynn Stallmaster, who was casting the picture, and he liked me, and he gave me a copy of the script to go away to a coffee shop and come back. Luckily, I'd already read the novel, and 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 and, and uh, long story short, I, uh, John Borman liked me. I went back and saw him two or three more times. Eventually, they flew me out here to to California, and and tested me, and and uh, and then. And then a couple of three weeks later, they found Ned, and mm-hmm. and and then they spent another five or six weeks looking for. The, it's probably the first time in the history of film that the two guys below the title were actually sort of. I, I wouldn't say we were cast because you know they wouldn't make the deal until they had everybody, mm-hmm. but but they found both me and Ned early on and said that we had the roles, although they had not made the deal. Uh, we were found before John. Uh, Voight and Burt Reynolds were. Wow, wow. Let me ask you about Borman. Uh, I would think that would be a very fortunate uh, blessing for you just starting out in your career yeah, to absolutely. be under the direction of that man. How did he direct you? I, he, John was the most I, I, wonderful, especially for a new young actor like me. I, I'd never been in front of a camera before, and he, he, what he, what he did was, was he. It almost seemed like we were free to improvise. Now, I'm not saying that John Borman wasn't in absolute strict control of the film at all times, because he was. Mm-hmm. But we but we spent two weeks basically rehearsing all these scenes, sort of in free form. I mean, we just we 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 what we explored were were the relationships of the characters mm-hmm. and sort of what was going on. And so what happened was, out of that, and the four of us developed such a, a nice rapport with each other, that that pretty soon 
we, through John Borman, had the freedom to sort of go wherever it was, Whoever we wanted to, that was still true to the to the script and true to the character, and not screwing up any other character. Right, right. And 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 uh, and so and so we never felt stifled. Of, uh, I mean, if you if you did something that didn't work, I mean, you, you said something. Uh, I mean, there was never any recrimination. It was just John would say that doesn't work, and and, sure. and we would do it again. But 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 you always had that freedom, and because we had that freedom. I, I think that there's that there's a, a lot of amazing things that that happen in the film. Yeah, that's an extraordinary film. It, it is a real curiosity of mine. Obviously, you knew the disturbing nature of the material when you read it. Of course. Um, but then again, it's it's a bunch of guys around the same age group uh, on a on a kind of like camping type set. You're spending all the time together. I would think that. There would be a real camaraderie and, and nice atmosphere around that set as well. But when you watch the finished project, the finished product, uh, did it surprise you how effective and how frightening that movie was? Yeah, I was. I was. What was amazing about that? It was. It, it was iconic in lots of ways mm-hmm. because it was the first time men had ever been put in the position that women had been put in through the years. Mm-hmm. Mm. You know, uh, uh, that position, that, that whole, the, the, the rape or whatever, you know, yeah. all of a sudden the men were having to face that. And, and, and it was a very disturbing film. If you go back and look at that film today, and it holds up fairly well today, yes, it does. by today's standards it has very little overt violence, mm-hmm. but, but it is a terribly harrowing film. Yes, mm-hmm. and yeah, you... and I think the, I think part of that has to do with the the genius of John Borman, and, and and serendipitously another aspect of that. I don't know if you know this or not, but but Deliverance is one of the few films I think in history that's shot in sequence. Huh. I did not well, know that. Okay. That makes that makes sense. Yeah. 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 And, and 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 if you think about it. Because most films, uh, most films are are dictated by the bottom line. I mean, if sure. you're if you're at, at this location four times, then you're going to shoot all four times when you're at that location, mm-hmm. and, and, and 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 that's just how. And, and most films are that way. Well, Deliverance starts at point A and goes to point B. You're never in the same place twice, mm-hmm. so there's mm-hmm. never any reason. To ha- and also, the, the 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 easy rapids are at the beginning of the film. The rapids get harder and harder as you go along. Uh, there's every reason in the world to shoot this in sequence. And the and the other aspect of it that that then pays off incredibly is that if you if you skin your knee or if you bump your head or or scratch your face. You don't have to cover that up if you're doing a because you're not doing a scene previous <laughs> the, the yeah. next day. You, yeah. you can you can deal you can limp <laughs> if yeah. your if your leg hurts. For instance, I don't know if you know, remember, but you know at the end of the film where there's a ha- canoe that's broken in half. Mm-hmm. They didn't have to break that in half. <laughs> we did that. <laughs> wow. It was it was there for them to to, to take. <laughs> That's amazing, and it, and it would produce an emotional continuity too. That yeah, I think would it, be very. It did indeed. I, I'll tell you another way that it sort of paid off in a way that you would never think of. It, uh, uh, next time you watch Deliverance, uh, the, the 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 climb when John Borman, uh, John Boyd, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, when yeah. John Boyd is climbing up the mountain, there is one remarkable shot where his hand is in close up, and his hand reaches up and grabs a rock, and he sort of pulls himself up. And and in that shot, his watch is there, and the face of his watch is is clouded over with steam. Mm-hmm. Now you would never ever think to do that. Mm. That was that was the, the manifestation of his being having been in the water all this time, and and, and the, his watch that he was wearing was that way. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, um, and, it, and it pays off in a way. I mean, it's a subliminal way. It. It. it you. You. You don't really register it uh, consciously, but unconsciously, it just lends such. What's the term? Verisimilitude. Sure. <laughs> to, yeah. to, to yeah. what's going on. There's there's such an immediacy to that film. I mean, it's very very authentic. Let me ask you about uh, the different kinds of roles that you've done. 
you've said in the past that you, you're just concerned with playing different characters. You want to play as many different types of people as possible. Um, is, is there something that's, that's missing from all of these roles for you? Is there one kind of uh, role or type of role that, that you've missed out on, do you think? I, not really. I, I, I just I just want I want things that challenge me and things that mm-hmm. that, that, that 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 you know it sounds cliched and trite, but things that speak to the human condition. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Nothing is trite about that. Oh, yeah, no. and, and, but what I found through the years is is that day in and day out, the ones that are almost the most fun to play are nearly always the villains. <laughs> you, you, you have played some of the greatest <laughs> villains. I'll give you that. Um, yeah. Well, and, and because he, I, I liken it to painting. If you're the good guy, you get three colors: red, white, and blue. Mm-hmm. If you're the bad guy, you get the whole palette. <laughs> True. <laughs> That's terrific, yeah. And and you have had a great career, if not playing villains, of of playing people of of authority as well. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes I, uh, well, that's what's so funny nowadays as, as a musician when I go around, and and people are so used to seeing me either as the president or the dictator of Mars right. or, mm-hmm. or Dick Jones or or yeah, Dick Jones. Or, <laughs> or the guy on Stargate, the evil senator, or, the, or you know, I, I've, I've played, and I love playing those, but, but then to think of me with a guitar in my hand and, and, and singing folk songs, and it, 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 it sometimes sort of makes their heads go funny. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, have you noticed since you've started acting, you've been in the business for a long time, I'm, obviously, the business goes through has gone through enormous changes uh, since the 70s. Um, has that affected uh, you as an actor at all, or is it all the same process no matter what? Well, it, you know what's funny is I, I've been lucky. I've had a wonderful career, and 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 there was a time there in the middle 80s and to. to Middle 80s through the middle 90s, I was in every film made <laughs> for a while. <laughs> and, and, and I've been really lucky. I've had, I see, I've had a, I've had the most wonderful home life anyone could have. Mm-hmm. I, 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 and, 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 and acting was never the be all and end all with me. And I think mm-hmm. that that's what's made it seem. So when it's gone through these changes. I made a life decision about six years ago that what gave me the most enjoyment was the music. And so now I'm I'm sort of the opposite of most actors. M- most actors, you know, because it, it's hard to get jobs these days. I, I have to say it hasn't been that difficult for me to get jobs because I'm not looking. Uh, right. And these days, uh, if they want me to act in a film, they have to beg me pretty hard. And and also as a as a given, they have to make room for my music. I won't. I'm a, I'm the opposite of most actors. Most actors who who also sing, you know, have escape clauses uh, from their singing gigs in mm-hmm. case they get a big movie. Mm-hmm. I'm the opposite. I yeah. I will not take a movie or a television show that interferes with with a with a music gig. Well, follow your passion. Follow your yeah. follow your, your bliss. Uh, you know, as as pretentious as that sounds. Yeah, exactly, um, and I and I and I've you know I've turned down a couple of films, and and frankly, in Hollywood, sometimes they they say, what, what, "What are you talking about?" And finally, they said they said to me, "They said, well, how much are they paying you on that folk music kick?" And I said, <laughs> "I said I've probably got more money in my pocket than they're paying me." <laughs> <laughs> but but that's not the point. The point right. is, uh, I, I've been lucky. I've made enough money. I'm not rich. But I probably have enough money, if I'm prudent, that I can live out the rest of my life, and and I choose to do what I choose to do now. Yeah, do what you love, and, and it's great music, and you have many CDs available. And actually, if you go to RonnieCox.com, yep. uh, you can you can read more about uh, your career both in film and in, in music. Uh, so tell me the genre, the genre of music that you enjoy. Would you say that it's folk based or well, I, for one of a better title, I would call it folk, but, but it, acoustic oriented. It's, it's so hard. To, first of all, my tastes are so eclectic. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I I I grew up playing Texas swing, a, 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 a jazzy, bluesy kind of stuff. I like standards. I, I, 
just as a as a as an overall view, acoustic oriented is about the best way I can say. I once heard a definition of folk music. Someone said, "If if I like it, it's folk." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I like that definition. That's a good, good and and that sort of works for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I, I I like Western. I I grew up in New Mexico, so there's a lot of the. I'm not really a country music fan, but I like I like the old Western, especially Western swing, mm-hmm. sure, and stuff like that. But but I, I there's hardly any kind of music I don't like. And you're going to Ireland next year i i am i i got i i've been approached by a, a guy who runs these little irish tours and 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 a friend of mine john smith who's a wonderful singer songwriter folks artist has has been leading these and what they do is they take at the most 15 or 20 people and rather than go on the typical tour big tour buses and stuff like that we go in just little tiny coaches and stay in either bed and breakfast or small hotels and we go around and the emphasis is is, is going to the little out of the way pubs and hearing the true authentic irish musicians wow and 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 we do that for like 10 days and mm. uh, well, that sounds like I, a lot I, of fun it, I think it will be. I, I'm. I mean, I'll take. I'll take 15 or 20 people with me, and and I'm not going to sing every day. I'll sing maybe a song because if I sang every day, and people would be sick of me. But but I'll you know I'll be I'll be there, and we'll do a song or two with the other with the Irish musicians. 